for our call to worship. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered.
keep on sinning so that God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. We are no longer at sin's every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-giving resurrection. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. So then, with confidence in the saving power of Christ, let us confess our sin together. Eternal God, in the story of Joseph, we see the terrible results of rivalry, jealousy, and division. But we also remember that Paul had to confront the same sorts of things in the church, reminding people that they were all part of the body of Christ, each with an important role, and that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Forgive us for the ways we still create divisions, for the ways we see others as rivals, and for the pain and brokenness that it all causes. Sheaves in the field, 
Suddenly, my sheep rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around him and bowed down to my sheep. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brothers, saying, Look, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow down to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, and on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father bewailed him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the children with us today. Um, but I wanted to, I'll use this as sort of an opening today. Have a ball. And it reminds me of, you may remember these days from your own childhood, of remember those days out on the playground or during PE when you would play kickball or dodgeball or, and teams were picked. And somebody was designated as the captain of each team, maybe by the teacher, and then they picked who was gonna be on their team and, and how suddenly that could turn into something more. And it reminded me, I've kind of forgotten about a lot of those days from childhood until, uh, until we started doing scouting stuff. And, and often the, I mean, towards the end of a meeting, the scouts would go and, uh, and they would play a game at the end of their meeting. And often that game became dodgeball. And it got to be interesting because now as an adult, I can watch the dynamics of who was being chosen for each team. And the fact that there are often even some guys, uh, in that case it was a boys troop, some of the guys, they didn't even want to play dodgeball. It was not their thing. They wanted to do other stuff. And they would kind of sit over at the side by themselves, just kind of bored because it was not something they even wanted to do. And then as the game got going, of course, as boys are, they got extremely, you know, competitive. Somebody would get beaten in the head at some point, and things would break down, and the adults would have to say, okay, time out, it's time to go. But to watch all that as an adult was a great reminder of the ways that we create all of those kinds of divisions and animosity and, and frustrations. You know, there's, there's guys that don't even want to be playing the game, and yet it's being forced upon them, and, and others that are the ones dictating, like, no, this is the game we're gonna, and even as adults, we had to say, okay, now you've got to start playing some other games. You can't just play dodgeball week after week after week, and yet, as soon as you gave them the choice, what do you wanna play? We're gonna play dodgeball. And then you see several other kids over there just shaking their heads. They don't wanna be a part of it. And so we have all these ways, even as kids, of creating divisions and frustrations and uh, you know all of this kind of tension going on. But we do that as adults too, don't we? And, and as often we saw with the scouts, uh, we do it as adults, we're, we're kind of oblivious to it sometimes. Sometimes we know we're creating division, it's our desire to create division with other people, we, we, we somehow feed off of that, but, but often I think we do it that we don't even recognize we're doing it. Just something about our way, our choices, our, our, our preferences, and we don't even think about somebody else's, you know, where they are, whether they want to be a part of it or not. We, we do that as adults, we don't even think about what are the things that we believe and say, the things we say to other people, the, the things we do that actually cause us some friction with the people around us or, or cause divisions and, and people to, to, to kind of not want to be a part of it. It's something to think about today as we think about the story of Joseph. It seems like a simple story on the surface, and yet we can quickly begin to realize that there are really no innocent parties here. It's a little more complicated than it appears on the surface. Through Lent, we have reflected on the stories of Abraham, and Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob, now Joseph, four generations then of this family who were the first of God's called people, chosen people, the Apostle Paul lifted up Abraham as the great exemplar of faith and justification by faith. And later the author of the Hebrews, whoever that was, wrote about Abraham saying, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going, for he looked forward to the city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. And after lifting up Abraham and others as examples of faith, and our cloud of witnesses, the author of Hebrews said, it is now our turn to run our own race and to set our eyes on Jesus. 
So these weeks we have been reflecting on this ongoing story of this family from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and now to Joseph. This family who was on the one hand claimed by God through a promise. A promise that God originally made to Abraham but then renewed with each generation of the family after that. The promise would go on even as the family moved from one generation to the next. But we've talked about how we have to be careful too. Because on the other hand, as they lived their lives in the real world, they definitely did not always trust in God or live particularly faithful lives. During Lent, we have kept those two themes in contrast because we too are sort of a mixed mixture of both. We're, we're a mixed bunch. Those, these are people who promise Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph these are people of the promise, and in the promise, there is always potential. Always potential. But sometimes, it is a promise that is not realized because of how these people respond in less than promising ways. So now on this last Sunday of Lent, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, so, so this is the last regular Sunday of Lent. We see this family of promise is now divided. And they must deal with rivalry and jealousy. Joseph's brothers are angry with him and resent the way that their father gives him special attention. So they sell him off into slavery. There's plenty of blame to go around here. It's not an easy case. Jacob's favoritism, the father's favoritism, created these feelings of unfairness and rivalry and jealousy within the family. The father did that. Joseph also showed a profound, a profound lack of tact in telling his brothers, I don't care what your dream is, some things just should not come out of your mouth. Because he told his brothers and then his father even that he had had these dreams about ruling over them. You think that's going to go over well in a family? No. And then the brothers faced the decision about how to respond. And there's a lot of different paths they could have taken. And they chose to react understandably, but badly. It could have been worse, but it certainly could have been better. So they all certainly have a role to play in how this story plays out. I remember doing a funeral a long time ago for a family that I came to discover in the midst of it all was very divided along lines that I could only start counting up as the funeral plans progressed. The mother had died in this family in her 50s, apparently, and the dad had gotten remarried. And some of the then adult children responded more graciously to that and accepting of that. But there was one daughter, adult daughter, who always felt a little bit like it was a betrayal of her mom. And she didn't really want to be around dad anymore. At the same time, the father spent a lot more time with one of his sons. Sounds a little like Jacob. He didn't spend quite as much time with the other kids and their family. We came decisions about vacations and where to visit and who to visit. It was pretty obvious where the time was going. But in this now situation, the biggest factor seemed to be a piece of property. Isn't it interesting how often that happens? This was a townhouse near a beach down in Florida somewhere. Two of the children visited there quite a bit with their families, but the other two never did. So the father decided
decided to leave it outright in his will to the two who vacationed there. One of them, of course, was his favorite. Well, it wasn't a cheap place, obviously, a place on a beach in Florida, and the other children suggested that maybe it should be sold and the funds divided evenly amongst the four of them, and one of the inheritors seemed all right with that, that seemed to be the fair thing to do, but the other clearly wasn't going to give in. And I'll just leave it that the funeral was awkward. And while some nice things were said about Dad, it was pretty noticeable that when I looked out into the crowd, into the family, it was noticeable that there were some stoic faces on some of the people. And some just sat there silently throughout. And I could tell the dynamics of who was sitting in which cues and which family members are interacting with which others. Funerals, as any pastor can tell you, and some of you have witnessed yourselves, can sometimes be awkward and tense. There are, of course, those dreaded times for any minister when you have the current wife and the former wife both there together. I'm glad to say that in the case of Jacob and his family, they all made amends by the end. If you want to read the next 13 chapters, it is quite a story. But of course, families are not the only place where divisions and rivalries and jealousy and bad reactions take place. Many of us have probably had things like that happen at work along the way somewhere. I had a boss one time who liked putting his favorite guys in key positions, some of whom were clearly less experienced and not up to the task. And yet they were the chosen ones. That was in my army days. We called it the Fellowship of the Ring. Anyone know what that is? Of course, it's an old term like... Uh, you know, Frodo and, and gang, the, the fellowship of the ring. Um, but in this case, the ring meant the West Point ring. We had a battalion commander who had gone to West Point, and he got those guys who had also gone to West Point, put them into all of the staff positions, and some of them were totally incompetent. What effects do you think that has on the other people? <laughs> it was clear favoritism. But it was also noticeable how it not only caused conflict between everyone else and the boss, but it also now caused conflict between people who had once been colleagues and friends. It was set up like that. Favoritism. And of course, in the New Testament, we find that Paul's church in Corinth was suffering from divisions and people thinking that they were better than others in the church for various reasons. And there is that whole list that Paul gives, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, that seems to say something about what was happening in that church. Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions. And he says, in contrast to those kinds of worldly things going on, you can see why the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, and the others would be so needed in the middle of what was basically also a family conflict. It's just a church family. So these were people of promise, a family of promise, through whom God had chosen to work in the world. People called to be a blessing to the peoples around them. People with a future that was in God's hands. God was leading them into that future. Jacob and Joseph and all of his brothers. But they were also deeply flawed. Jacob played favorites. Joseph was tone deaf in sharing his dreams of ruling his brothers. Reuben. 
Reuben trying to spare his life, but in the end just went along with the scheme. And Judah, the forefather of the tribe that would beget Jesus, actually came up with this little plot to sell Joseph off to the foreigners. And all the rest were willing participants. The good news is that in the end, God will be at work even in the midst of their brokenness. And even in the midst of all their scheming. Even when they are looking out for themselves, God's will will be worked out. God will reconcile this family to each other by the end of the story. And God's promise will continue to be worked out sometimes through them, as you will find out if you read the rest of the story of Joseph, it is amazing the way that God's will is worked out through the midst of all of this. But sometimes, God's will will be worked out seemingly in spite of it. And I think much is the same in our own lives. We are a mixed bag, all of us. Sometimes God is at work in our lives and through us, and it's obvious that we are on board with the plan. But sometimes we aren't. We have to recognize that God's will will be done in spite of us. But through it all, we believe in God's grace. And that we are a part of it, and God does not give up on us. And God will continue to have us as part of the promise and a part of his work in the world. How all of that works out and how we might be more aware of the faults and the divisions and the times that we are less than promising, though, is a good reflection for Lent as we come upon Easter. That great story of new life and hope and future, in spite of us, and in spite of that. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise and sing together with us hymn number 379, We Shall Overcome. A good story, a good song, I should say, for the story of Joseph and his brother.
your joys and concerns. Yes, Pat. All of the people who have been impacted so terribly in Mississippi, Alabama, and now Troop County this morning uh, from the tornadoes. Tornadoes, yes. The tornadoes. Can I say it? Yeah. All right. Um, Bob, did you have? Uh, spoke with Bill Ward for this morning, and him and Pat are still trying to get off the cold. He said, I can move back as soon as I can. Oh. Yeah, but. Yeah, the was under the weather. What, Mary Lou? I have a neighbor of a grandfather who was raising two little granddaughters, and he now has cancer and is in chemo. Wow. And our neighbors are at a loss, black news, all the way and uh, just asking for prayers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. for Eva and Janice. Yes. My friend, one of the daughters in the past, been suffering with the treatment of chemotherapy for breast cancer, recently had her seven week treatment and had a severe allergic reaction to chemo. She sent us a picture of her bald head and her rash all over her body. Wow. One word in the said, see. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where the, the cure is almost worse than the disease. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Prayers for all those around the world who are suffering from evil, such as Ukraine, Syria, Yemen. Talk about all those ways that we create divisions with others. There are some pretty horrific ways that that is done as well. All right, friends, let us pray. Oh Lord, this day we gather together as your people. And while we are certainly all different from each other, 
have different ideas about things, different experiences in life, come from different things going on this week. Somehow you bring us together to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is not because we agree on everything or are all perfect people, but Lord, it is purely because of your grace and because Christ is in our midst. So Lord, out of that commonplace, and out of your love that fills us and helps us to see beyond ourselves, to focus beyond ourselves to, to you and our neighbor, Lord, we lift up our prayers this morning. We pray for people around the world who are dealing with enmities and strife and division and war and live in fear every day. Lord, we pray for people in those places. And unfortunately, there are almost too many to count. Lord, may your church, not just here, but around the world, be a sign of your kingdom of peace and grace and forgiveness. And a sign that in Christ, we may be healed. And brought back together to be reconciled to you and one another. Lord, out of this place of love and concern for those who are in our lives, for our families, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, we lift up all those who've been affected over the last hours by tornadoes, for those who have lost family members, who have lost homes and jobs. Lord, be with all of them. We pray for the Borsmas, um, that your healing hand will be upon them, and they will feel better soon. And we pray for Mary Lou's neighbor uh, in such a difficult situation. We pray for his two grandchildren, for that family, Lord, guide them and help them through this time. Lord, help, help them and those in their lives to figure out a way. Um, Lord, be amongst that. We pray for the bars for Michael's surgery coming up this week. That it will be successful and that you will heal him. We pray the same way for Mindy's surgery. Lord, that uh, through that and for treatments, uh, Lord, that she will be healed. We pray for Eva and Janice. Lord, be with them during, during this time in their life, in their life together. Lord, reassure them of your presence there among them, that Eva is in good and loving hands. We pray for Linda May and for chemo during a very difficult week and phase. Of Lord, guide her doctors and give her strength that they may move forward from this and that it will, it will help more than hurt. Lord, we pray for Peg's father and for her friend Cheryl Lord, continue to strengthen them during this time. And Lord, thank you for all of the friends, the brothers, the sisters in Christ, the family members who love us and who lift their prayers for us as well. Lord, help us to be good and to be better brothers and sisters in Christ to all. For we pray in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And Lord, please also be with Debbie and Nolan, and that entire family, and friends, and brother, and Ty, and Billy, during an incredibly difficult time. Friends, as we consider all of these kinds of things going on in people, the lives of people that we know and in our world, we, like Joseph's brothers, always have a choice of how to respond to difficult situations. May we choose a path that is full of love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, generosity faithfulness, self-control. Lord, may we be those of promise who are a blessing to others in their times of need, who are those who share a word and an act of kindness and hope and love. From that place of being Christ's church in the world and Christ's people, let us rise and give thanks for your gifts that have been brought to do the work of this church this week and this day. And let us sing together the Dachshund.
great line was that we are called to be agents of hope. Agents of hope. We can certainly choose to be agents of division or agents of harm or agents of discouragement to others. And yet, as followers of Jesus, we need to examine it. Instead, be agents of hope for those who fill our lives every day. You may be that key person this week to be a ray of hope in the name of Christ for someone else. Be that person. And go this day in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.